Take your Bibles to Matthew chapter 5 tonight. Matthew chapter 5. If you need a handout, there is still got some back there. Turn on the microphone. Thank you guys. I appreciate it. Matthew chapter 5. I'm going to preach an old message that I have preached probably four or five times here at church. I have preached this all over the country. God has used it down through the years. Matthew chapter 5. It is a message that Christians, if you've never heard this message, I, I'd ask you to really get in tight tonight. If you've heard it before, and uh, which many of you have. Uh, many of you have not because I know you're too new for, for you to have heard it. But uh, if you've heard it and had it before, uh, I don't know about you, but I need it frequently. It's called the cycle of Christian growth. The cycle of Christian growth. And we're going to look at it tonight in Matthew chapter 5. In Matthew chapter 5, Jesus begins the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, constitution of Christianity. Somebody has said there's the multitudes he's speaking to, there's the mountain he speaks of, on, and then there's the message, and then after this, those three chapters of the Sermon on the Mount is to go out into ministry. So in chapter, we're going to look at this tonight. Now, uh, we're going to go through this, and I just want you to think about your life, what's happened in your life, and, uh, and where, I want you to see where am I at in this cycle. God has got the universe set up on cycles. Uh, they claim that every seven years we have an entirely new physical fleshly body but because the body has replaced the cells. As the whole world is set up on cycles. Uh, birth is set up on cycles. And on and on it goes. And the sun goes in cycles, uh, you know, and so, and so forth. And the, and the universe is set up in it. Your Christian life is set up in a cycle. Now, it's very important that you understand this because... This, this kept me, probably, this message probably kept me in the ministry. If I hadn't understood this, I probably would have kicked out years ago. And God, by His grace, helped me to get a hold of this. And so we're going to look at it tonight, and I pray that it'll be a help to you. Lord, we need your help. Uh, Lord, without you, we can do nothing. And certainly, Lord, a man can't preach and feed the flock of God. And uh, Lord, have the, the, any good at all without the power and unction of the Holy Ghost. I pray God tonight, make this message a blessing, because Lord, you've given us here uh, eight blessings and a ninth blessing, a double blessing at the end, and Lord, I pray this will be a blessing to these people, help us to know God that we can experience the blessings of God through, these, uh, through this cycle of Christian growth. Lord, help us to know that you're in a desire of this whole thing, is that we would be salt and light to this world and bring glory to the Lord Jesus Christ. God bless this message tonight in Jesus' name for your glory's sake and for their good. Amen. Amen. Chapter 5 and verse number 1. Now, we're going to take off and read, then we're going to come back. And seeing the multitudes, he went up into a mountain, and when he was said, his disciples came unto him, and he opened his mouth and taught them, saying. It's amazing to me the greatest message ever preached was preached setting down. And also you can learn here that preaching is also teaching. Preaching should always teach, and teaching should always have a little preaching in it. Amen? But he sat down and he taught them here, and yet it is a preaching message. When he opened his mouth he, and taught them saying, and he begins with these. Now, his ministry began with eight blessings, and it ended in Matthew 23 with eight cursings. Eight is the number of new beginning in the Bible. Nine, there's actually nine blessings. The last Beatitude, the last blessing is a double blessing. How many would be interested in getting a double blessing tonight? Oh, raise your hand high because you're going you're gonna to wonder about it later, okay? Now, so he takes off today. He opened his mouth and talked to him saying, First of all, the first blessing is, Blessed are they that are poor in spirit, for theirs is what, everybody? What is it? The kingdom of heaven. This verse is talking about salvation tonight. This verse is talking about salvation tonight. Now, I want to just show you what the reality of a lost person's life is. Before you and I were saved, we were literally, there was no order, there was no direction, there was no purpose, there was chaos, just like, the, not chaos necessarily, but without form and void, and, the, and upon the face of the deep, darkness, and the light of God shining in our heart with the light of the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ. Now... You and I out here just, I don't know about you, but my life is just kind of like this. But one day I heard the gospel. I heard the preaching of the cross. I heard that I was a sinner. I heard that I was going to hell in my condition. But I heard Jesus died for me on that cross. And there came a point of conviction in my life. I was convicted that I was guilty. And 
that conviction brought me to, to a, a brokenness. Now, when the Bible says here, blessed are the poor in spirit, that phrase, poor in spirit, means spiritually bankrupt. No man ever gets saved till he realizes he is spiritually bankrupt. Amen. As long as he thinks he's got a little spiritual money in the bank or he's got to figure out a way to, to, to pay his bill against God, which is self-righteousness, he does not declare bankruptcy. You know what getting saved is? It's coming before God Almighty and declaring, I am bankrupt. I don't have anything to pay my sin debt. I can't satisfy the just demands of God. And I'm broke spiritually. I'm a lost sinner, a wicked sinner, and have no righteousness of my own. I have nothing to pay my sin debt with. I'm bankrupt before God what this about and he said blessed are the poor spirit those people who realize they don't have anything to save themselves with you'll never get saved to come to this point that's why that's why I really have trouble with this come forward and say this prayer and all this kind of stuff because it's the lacking of the brokenness and Jesus said, I'm near to those that have a broken and a contrite spirit, and you must be born again of the Spirit of God, and God is going to deal with your spirit. And this is why a lot of people never get saved, because they'll only come forward if there's everybody else coming forward, and they'll only, they're only do Christian things if, if it's kind of going to make them look Christian in the eyes of other people. But there's never been a brokenness before God Almighty, saying, God, I'm a wicked, hell-deserving sinner. I have nothing to offer you. And I want to ask you tonight, have you ever been there have you been there have you been where you said lord i am bankrupt i don't have any righteousness of my own i'm a wicked lost sinner deserving of hell and if you until you get there you'll never be saved as long as you think you're a pretty good person or if everybody else gets there you'll get there you'll never be saved you must become and realize that you are spiritually bankrupt by the way you are spiritually bankrupt whether you even know it or not you don't have anything to buy your way into heaven to earn your way into heaven you are bankrupt before God Almighty and God says if you'll realize that you're poor in spirit and don't have anything then you'll see the cross for the need of the cross you will see the need of a savior you'll see the need of his blood you'll see the need of his sacrifice and you will run to the cross and receive Jesus Christ as your Savior as a bankrupt sinner but you found the one who can pay the price amen, amen. and he said this for theirs who theirs is the kingdom of heaven they got saved Does that make sense now you're going to keep mind Jesus preaching here by and large a Jewish crowd who knew the Old Testament and they knew exactly what he was saying us Gentiles have a little bit of problem about this. But they understood what he was saying. And he said, blessed are they that poor spirit for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. The first one, so what happens? You got saved. Now watch this. And you were broken. And this first beatitude has to do with your salvation. All right? You got, you got saved. That's the first beatitude is what it's about. Blessed are the poor in spirit, those who realize they're spiritually bankrupt, who come to God with their bankruptcy and say, God, I don't have anything to offer you but my, my wickedness. And, man, he, he takes care of your bankruptcy. Amen? Amen. He takes care of it. Pays the bill. Amen. So you got saved, first beatitude. Now you're on your Christian journey. How many have been at least to the first beatitude? There was a time in your life. When you were bankrupt before God, lost sinner, and you came to Jesus to have your bill paid, and, and your bankruptcy has been taken care of. All right, that's wonderful. Now, oh, that happened to me on January 24th, 1982, and I came to God as a bankrupt <laughs> religious man, and he saved me. Amen? Now, the next thing it says this. Watch this. Second beatitude, blessed are they that mourn, uh, for they shall be comforted. This has to do with something that is so involved in Christianity and people don't like it. It has to do with continual, the Bible, it, write, write this down on a sheet of paper, 2 Corinthians chapter 7, it teaches you what repentance is. And repentance is godly sorrow and its effect is, there are seven evidences of true repentance in 2 Corinthians chapter 7. All through the, you know what the prophets continuously told Israel and told the people? Turn. Turn, turn for your wicked ways. Turn, you, just, you can't read the prophets without seeing this. The Old Testament term, terminology was turn from your wrongdoing. Now let me just tell you something. Repentance doesn't save anybody. Could my tears forever flow? 
Could my zeal no longer know? These for sin cannot atone. Thou must save and thou alone. But let me just tell you this. You ain't going to get saved without repenting. That's right. Amen. And repentance is not a work that you do. Repentance is a work that God the Holy Spirit does in you, leading you to repentance. The goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance. Amen. All right? And this has to do with what we were just talking about, coming to the point where you realize you're bankrupt and you repent toward God and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. But did you know the Christian life is a continual repenting? Amen. Yeah. Continual repenting. And what it means is this, as you're growing in the grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ, you're going to turn from some things. And the old timers used to put it this way, the things I used to do, I don't do no more for the Lord, but it's changing me. And that doesn't always all happen the night you got saved or the day you got saved. But he said this, well watch this, blessed are they that mourn for they shall be comforted. I am telling you tonight that the old timers used to say confession is good for the soul. One of the reasons we're in a psychotic nation that needs pills and all kinds of stuff to get, get, get some kind of comfort is because we don't understand and practice the doctrine of repentance. Yeah. And instead of repenting and saying God and confessing and saying, he that covereth his sins shall not prosper, but he that confesseth them and forsaketh them shall have mercy. Now, what God is saying here, that if you truly got saved, you will have godly sorrow about your sin. The Holy Spirit within you will say, that wasn't right, and you need to get it right. And let me just tell you something. God, the Holy Spirit, will comfort you if you'll do that. You won't have all the junk going through your head and all the wrestling in your brain and all the... Here's what happens. Instead of mourning over our sin <clears throat> and repenting of it and, and having a godly... See, God, godly sorrow, that means that you realize you sinned against God. You grieved the Holy Spirit. You did that which is in disobedience to God. And your spirit knows that, and that hurts you, and you know it hurts God. You know it hurts your testimony. You know it brings reproach to Jesus Christ. <clears throat> and you have a godly sorrow in your heart. Oh, I wish, how many sinned and wish you hadn't done it? <laughs> how many sinned and you just grieved about it? Why on earth did I do that? How stupid could I have been? And you grieve about it, and you have a godly sorrow. Let me just tell you something. I'm going to be honest with you. You don't need my counseling to get comfort. That's right. You don't need pills to get comfort. And you don't need southern comfort. Yeah, right. The liquor. And you don't need marijuana. Yeah, right. You need to confess your sins and have a right attitude and a godly sorrow so that you can get genuine comfort. The Holy Spirit is the comforter. But I'm going to tell you something. He ain't going to comfort you as long as you're lying about what's went on in your life. Or as long as you're justifying what's been going on in your life. Or as long as you're rationalizing sin or justifying it or blaming somebody else. You ain't never going to get comforted. You're going to be tormented within. And I'm telling you, God is trying to be a blessing to you. And he's saying, blessed is the man who not only is the poor in spirit who gets saved. He's blessed. He ain't going to hell. But the man who is on it, behold, thou desires truth in the inward parts. That will bring blessing into your life. Amen. And everybody wonder what you're so glad and happy about. <laughs> Amen. That's right. Everybody wonder why you're so peaceful and the world's falling apart. Yep. You're blessed. Because yep. the Holy Spirit comforts you because you're honest with God about your sin. Amen. You don't blame everybody else and, and rationalize it and justify it and all that kind of junk. You get comfort. Amen. And I'll tell you something. You know what that means? It means that sometimes you're going to, oh, buddy, uh, oh, Uncle Buddy Robinson said, called it a spiritual painkiller. He said, sometimes you've got to go off in the brush or in the woods and get on your face and say, God, I've sinned against you. And I'm here to get this thing right, and I ain't monkeying around about it. And I did thus and thus. And I'll just tell you something. The Holy Spirit will get involved in the person who genuinely has that and who has a mourning spirit towards sin. And God says, I'll comfort you, and that's a blessing. Amen? So what happens to us? I don't even what I did with my marker. Does anybody know what I did with my marker? Right there it is. Okay. So here's the second one. The first one is poor spirit. Second one is you learn to mourn over sin. Now, here's the deal. You learn to have the right attitude towards sin. 
a godly sorrow towards sin. This is, by the way, this is evidence that you really got saved. I want to tell you something right now. I wouldn't give you a nickel for that person that walks up the aisle of a church popping bubble gum and looking around and watching to see if there's any, any mosquitoes flying around. I come to get saved. I ain't buying that. Nor am I buying the Christian who, say, who says, well, I sinned, but I'm going to tell God. He said he'd be faithful and just to forgive me all my sins, so I'm going to sin and sin and sin and sin, and God will confess, and I'll just keep confessing. I'll go live like, you don't know nothing about blessed are they that mourn. You don't know anything about that. Your spirit's wrong. Amen. Amen. I, I, listen, God wants to bless you, but he's holy. He wants to bless you with salvation, and then he wants to bless you with a right attitude and right response when you sin. And don't let nobody tell you Christians don't sin. They sin more than sinners sin. <laughs> I think, best I can tell. Amen. Amen. Now, the third thing, you're growing in the Lord. Now, here's what's going to happen. You got saved. You were broken. You were at the bottom. Amen. But here you start learning how to deal with sin as a Christian. And the third thing, what's the third blessing? Blessed are the who? Blessed are the meek. For what? For they shall inherit the earth. God ain't joking about that. He means exactly what he's saying. Now, meekness means yielded rights. You, don't have, you, you start growing in the Lord, one of the first things that happen to you is you don't have to have your way all the time. Amen. Let me give you an illustration. The, the, the Bible says that Abraham had all kinds of flocks, all kinds of camels. He had, I mean, this guy was loaded up, but he had a nephew named Lot, right? And Lot had herds, and they, herdsmen got to striving, right? They got to fight, fuss with each other, I imagine, over pasture, water, or something. Abraham said, sent a guy after Lot one day, said, you get your backside up here, man, you're going to have a, a go around. Your cattle have been on my pasture, and he kicked him and run him off and run him out of the country. Said, you ain't doing me that way. Is that how the Bible describes it? Sure ain't. The Bible said that Abraham initiated and said, watch this, watch this. He said to Lot, let there be no strife. We be brethren, watch this. We be brethren, let there be no strife between us, I pray. You know how to save your marriage? By being meek. You know, how to, you know how to stay in church? By being meek. You know how to keep serving God? By being meek. Yielding your, I don't have a right for you to come and listen to me, but God has a right for you to show up at church. Amen. Amen. But I don't have a right for you to like my preaching. I don't have a right for you to like my attitude. I don't have a, I don't have a right for you to listen. I don't have a right to nothing from you. You see, we think we've got a right for our wife to have socks in our drawer every time we go there to get them. I kind of do think that <laughs> sometimes. But if we're not careful, we pull our drawer out and ain't no socks in it. Where's my socks at? You ever wash around here? That's really good for marriage, ain't it? You know what the problem is? You're not meek. You, got, you thought you had a right to have socks in the drawer every time. Where's breakfast? I thought we had breakfast around here sometime in the mid-morning at least. You didn't put any gas in the car. What'd you do? Drive around town? You thought you had a right for everything. You know why people are mad all the time? Because they're just full of rights. And America, t and being, and by the way, the American culture will teach you that you got a right, you got a right, you got a right, you got a right. You got a right to be married. You got a right to have this. You got a right to have a home. You got a right to have this. You got to have a right to have that. You, I mean, it was just full of rights. If we don't get them, we're mad. And we're not mad just at everybody else. We're mad at God. We're mad at everybody. We're not blessed. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Well, watch this. Abraham said to Lot, we be brethren. Let there be no strife between us. That's what he said. Now, you know how I know I ain't Abraham? Because <laughs> I said, after I take this, you can have what's left. <laughs> Abraham didn't do that. Watch Abraham. Boy, you watch him in the Bible. He's your man on faith. He said, we be brethren. Let there be no strife between us, I pray thee. He said, if you take the left, I'll take the right. You take the right, I'll take the left. What? I can, let me tell you something, Abraham's a man of war. He had an army. He could have literally ran Lot out of the country. But he was meek. And you watch this. When you start saying, I've got to have my way, here's what's going to happen to you. The Bible says this, that right after Abraham told Lot that, you, you see his attitude, the Bible says he lifted up his eyes into the well-watered plains of Sodom. He said, I believe I'll take that bottom land. I believe I'll take those markets, and by the way, I'll, I'll get the Jordan River down there at the bottom land. He literally took what he thought was the very best property in the world at that time. 
And so he does it. And the Bible said, watch this, that he pitched his tent towards Sodom. And that was the, that was the destruction of his descendants. In verse 15, I believe it's verse 15, I like to envision it like this and give me a little bit of liberty here. But I, I see Abraham looking and says, he took the best land in the country. He's got the markets, he's got the water, and he's got the pasture. Left us up here in hillbilly country in the southern Ozarks among these hills and sprouts and rocks. And I believe the old devil probably walked up to Abraham and said, that's what you get for being a godly man. You're just trying to be a good godly man. Look at how you got treated. This is what you're left with. God really took care of you, didn't he? And God walked. And then I see God coming up, tapping Abraham on the shoulder. Abraham, watch this. I want you to look northward. I want you to look southward. I want you to look westward. I want you to look eastward. And all you see, I will give to you. And he did. Amen. Amen. Lot lost everything he fought for and and, and thought he finagled, and Abraham got it all. Now, you know why people aren't getting saved? Because preachers like Reg Kelly aren't meek, and it destroys your testimony. You ain't running over me like that. I knock teeth down your throat. You ain't treating me like that. I fight for my rights. Hey, right now, I've got a right to be appreciated around here. Doesn't anybody know how much I do for this place? Nobody said thank you, and I don't know how long. I've got a right to be appreciated. I've got a right to be recognized, praised, and patted on the back. And thanked. No, I don't. But if I've got that attitude, I'll be mad all my life. Because you know what? By and large, you ain't going to get thanked. And you ain't going to get appreciated. And you ain't going to get recognized. And you're not going to get patted on the back. And if you do, there might be ulterior motives for it. Yeah. If you want wisdom, you look at this book. Amen. Blessed are the meek. You know what? In all of the New Testament, there's very little that ever, where Jesus ever described himself. But he did this. He said, come unto me, all you that uh, are heavy laden. He said, come unto me and I'll give you rest. For he said, I am meek and lowly, your first two beatitudes. And then he said this, ye shall find rest unto your souls. Let me just tell you something. Abraham had rest. Because he acted on the wisdom of God. And he acted on faith. The Bible said Moses was the most meek man in the world. You study his life, I'll guarantee you. He's a thousand more times meek than I am. You don't make your, you don't save your marriage. Both parties need to be meek. Yield your right. You say, well, they just don't act like they love me like I think they ought to. Yield your right. Who told you you had a right for the perfect marriage? You'd be the first one. Right? Meekness. You, you want to be blessed? Did you catch what Abraham got? Blessed are the meek, Jesus said, for they shall inherit the what? Earth. Earth. What did Abraham inherit? Earth. Jesus taught us to lay our affections above. But guess who's going to reign with him on the earth in the millennial reign? The meek. It, he means exactly what he's saying. It's not fancy language. It's not mystical language. He means exactly what he's saying. Well, we've got to run. So you're, you're, you got saved and learned to have right attitude towards sin and you learned to yield your rights and not be mad all the time. And has anybody ever experienced this stuff besides me? One or two, okay. All right, what's the fourth beatitude? What's the next one? Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be half empty. They shall be filled. God says, he said, the next thing that happens, it will happen in your Christian experience is a hunger and thirst for uh, worldliness. If you're saved, if you're saved, the Holy Spirit w within you will produce a hunger and thirst for righteousness. Amen. He will not produce in you an attitude. I wonder how much I can get by and still go to heaven. 
He'll put an attitude in your heart to hunger and thirst for righteousness. And you, instead of Bible reading being my, well, boy, I've got to read my two chapters a day. You say, I wonder, if I can get, I wonder if I can get some time to read my Bible. And your Bible's not ever very far away from your chair or where, you're, where, you, where you can get a hold of it. Or it might be in your car in the way of a recording where you can listen to it. I have both that at, at my farm. I've got, I've got my Bibles laying there, and I've, then I've got where I, if I'm, I'm doing certain kind of work that I do where I can listen to the Bible on that. And I'm going to tell you something. I don't look at it like a pain, nor do I look at, man, I've got to get something to preach Sunday. i just got to get something to preach. That, if I had to do that, that wouldn't work. I'm kind of guy, you just don't force me kind of to, you know, you go to read your Bible, get you a message by Sunday. God put in me when he saved me a hunger and a thirst for righteousness. I don't do right all the time, but I want to know it, and I have a hunger and a thirst for it. And I'm telling you something, this is the water of life, amen? amen. This is the water of life. I'm going to ask it. So, so what will happen? He said, bless the hungry, for they shall be filled. Now, what's it mean being filled? Well, I'm going to tell you, bless God Almighty, fill with the Spirit of God because you're filled with the Word of God and you're satisfied, you're fulfilled in life, you've got purpose in life. God, you know why you're here. You know who put you here. You know where you're going. You're filled, amen. amen. I'm going to tell you, have you ever got so full you just running over? Yes. I hope we can get so filled this, in this church so this year that some of you run over and shout. Amen. Amen. I can prove to you shouting's doctrinal in the Bible. Yep. It's in the Bible, amen. Some, and some of you just ought to at least do a little practicing before you get to heaven because you're going to shout when you get to heaven, amen. amen. You're full, amen. You can't hold it no more. Yep. Filled with the Word of God. Filled with the truth of God's Word. Filled with the Spirit of God. Filled with the joy of the Lord. And God says, I'll fill you. You'll be satisfied. Everybody going out there, they're looking for this to fill them. And they're looking for fun to fill them. There's all kind of fulfillment going everywhere else trying to get filled. I'm going to tell you when you're happy. It's when you, you don't have to go nowhere and you're just happy to be home. <laughs> when you don't have to have a new truck. You like that old one. Drives just fine. No payments. Yeah. All righty. Now let's look at the next one. Number five. Here's the first. Blessed. Oh, this is. We ought to skip this one. Blessed are what? The merciful. For what? They shall obtain mercy. Now what's this talking about? God says, I saved you. And the first thing I did with you after I saved you is you're going to learn to have a right attitude about sin. Then he said, I'm going to teach you to be meek. The Holy Spirit's going to work meekness in you so you're not mad all the time. And so you can demonstrate Christianity to people. And then he said, I'm going to give you a hunger and thirst for what's right. And I'm telling you, I don't care whether it's a workplace, at the house, at the legislative seat, at the, at the courthouse, wherever you are, you want what's right to be done. Yes. Okay? Now he said, bless the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. I don't like this beatitude. <laughs> See, I'm all justice <laughs> till it comes to me. Then I want mercy. Justice for everybody else, mercy for me. Is that it? Anybody else like that in here besides me? All right, this, here's what this is about. You've been saved a while now, and God's going to teach you how to forgive. If you forgive those that trespass against you, how did he teach you to pray? Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. You know what God wants you and I to be? I'm going to ask you a question. We say, I want to be like Jesus. Doesn't Jesus forgive? Yes, Amen. This, blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. You want forgiveness, forgive. Somebody had mentioned, it's a, it's a legitimate question. Over there, when Jesus taught the, after that, he said, For if you forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. That doesn't mean you won't go to heaven. But it means you're go, God's going to deal with your Failure to forgive when you, before, you go, before you walk in at the judgment seat. That's right. Doesn't mean you lost your salvation. Right. It means that as a Christian, he told you to forgive people. You wouldn't forgive people. He's going to deal with it but at the judgment seat of Christ. Yeah. Now, I want to tell you a little something. God says it's a blessing. Blessed are uh, the merciful. If you want a blessing tonight, Reggie wants a blessing, forgive people. 
You know what? God knows you need it. God knows I need it. Yes, freedom. And so, I mean, this is, no, I'm going to tell you something. Now, this is tough stuff. We're, I'm not up here going, oh, this is so sweet, the Beatitudes. No, this is tough living. Only can be done by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. You don't forgive people without the power of the Holy Spirit working through you. But he said, blessed are the merciful, if they shall obtain mercy. And you know what? I, the, one of the best ways to do this is remind yourself of all that God has forgiven you. And if God has forgiven me this, this, surely I can forgive them for that. That does not mean you... You're going to go eat supper with them tomorrow night. It doesn't mean you're going to have fellowship. Are you listening to me? It doesn't mean everything's good between you. It just means that you are not holding that over them in bitterness and anger and unforgiveness. And you're going to give that to God. I'm going to give you a verse to write down in your kitchen. Commit it to him that judges righteously. Because you and I don't know the whole story. We don't even know why they did what they did to us sometimes. We don't know what was going on in the back of their mind or other situations that might have in influenced it. We have no clue. But we can sit there and carve it all out. And you know what happens if you don't forgive? You just sit there like a cancer, just eating on your mind, eating on your heart, eating on your peace, and just destroy your life. And God wants you free from that. He wants you blessed. He wants me blessed. Blessed are the merciful. for they. And so God's saying that you save you. He said, I want you to have the right attitude about sin. He said there, I want you to be meek and yield your right. Uh, 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 then he said, I want you to have a hunger and thirst after righteousness. And I want you to learn to forgive. How many things that Christian people should forgive pe other people? Let's, let's vote on it. It's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. All right, those hands. How many people think we should not forgive? <laughs> I preached the message one time. I ought to do it. It's been years. In fact, it was up on that pulpit there. I got on a board like this and I said, I want you to describe a Christian to me in one word. And I mean, they, they, they hit 40 or 50 words describing what a Christian ought to be like. We got done. I turned around to the congregation and said, has anybody ever seen one? Everybody said, no. <laughs> but that's what they ought to be. In this church, in my life, I'm going I'm, I'm to tell you something. I'm like a low jet flying toward eternity. I don't know whether I got five seconds, five years. I don't know. I'm, it's up to God. But I'm going to tell you something. I do not intend. And every day of my life, I fight this. I'm not going to lie to you. Every day of my life, Satan tells me, you ought to be bitter at them. You ought to think about them for the next two hours. <laughs> you ought to let that stir in your mind. And so you, can ha so you don't have any peace the rest of the whole day. And that's, that's, that's hell's junk. That's hell's junk. That's right. I mean, tell you what, one of the best things I can do is just say, well, bless the Lord, oh, my soul. And I'm going to tell you something. I sat right over in that seat, and, and Ben, ben started leading that song. Ben, I appreciate that. What was that last, remember that last song we sung? The name of it? The last song we sung? Anybody remember? I can't remember. It's just like preaching. I don't remember what I preached last week. Do you? Huh? What a Savior. And I got to look, reading the words of that. And I want to tell you, the glory, my man, the glory of God started coming on me. What a friend. Boy, I want to tell you something. And just like the Lord said, Reggie, I've got it. it. You'll be okay. I took you through all kinds of trials the last 40 years. You're going to be all right. You know. Anyway, we ought to learn to forgive. We've got to get going. Uh, the next one, number Eight, in verse number 8, the 6th commandment. Boy, this is so powerful. Blessed are the what? For what? They shall see God. Now listen to this close. You're in this growth of your Christian life. And the 6th one says pure in heart. This talks about the motives of why you do what you do. Why do you come to church? Why do you do right? Why do you sing? Why do you serve? Why do I preach? I had a man tell me one time, uh, he got all out of wax, left church. He said, that church is just all about you. It's all about you. I thought, whatever. I don't feel that way at all. I'll be honest with you. It's not about me. If it is, we're in bad, bad shape. 
But I will tell you this, I have to watch my motives while I'm preaching. What's my motive? To glorify God or to sound like, well, oh, that's a good message. Do I want the glory or do I want God to get glory? What's my motive? Is my heart pure? Why am I being friendly to you? Why do I shake your hand? Why do I treat you nice when you want to come to church? Just so you come to church, put money back here in the box? What's my motive? Why do I preach things? Why do I do things? Why, what am I do, what, why am I doing what am I doing? Is it for the glory of God? Is it to make our church look good? So everybody can say, oh boy. What's our motive? Why do we want people to be saved? We so we say, how oh, we had people saved? Or is it for God's glory? Amen. I am telling you something. If you grow, if you truly grow in the grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ, he will purify your hearts he, through the preaching of his word, through the reading of the word, through the meditation of the word. And God wants, I'm going to tell you, he's a pure God. Amen. And he purifies our hearts. Yes. Now watch this. He said, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Yeah. They will see God in a way that a man with an unpure heart cannot see God. They'll see his holiness, his righteousness. And they'll have a view through the scriptures of God that you will not have if your heart's not pure. He searches the heart, doesn't he, the Bible said? Amen. Search me, O God. See if there be any wicked way in me. Why are we doing what we're doing? I am telling you, there's nothing like Christianity. Don't, don't get down on me now, okay? Because it's a blessing to, to let God purify your heart. Why did you buy your wife roses? Huh? Somebody said something. Keep out of trouble. Good motive, amen? Why did we, why did we take her out to dinner? Uh... And she, says, and she says across the dinner table, what are you wanting? <laughs> right? You boys, ask that girl out. Oh, oh I've got to clarify something. I said boyfriends and girlfriends this morning. When I say that, I mean you need to be friends. I'm not talking about boyfriend and girlfriend. Okay? But, you, you know, that's how you meet people, by being friends. But I'm not talking about having some boyfriend, boyfriend for 40 years. I'm not talking about that. Or 16 boyfriends in six months. I'm not talking about that. I'm not talking about the world's definition of boyfriend. But God wants, you know, God created male and female. He ordained marriage. Go for it. Amen? But I kind of want to clarify that. Make sure you understood that. Work through your parents. And, and I mean, stay real close to God about it. Amen. So now what's the next? So now God wants to purify our heart. Oh my, I, I, could, I could chase that rabbit trail from here to Van Zant and back. How many of those were Van Zant's at, amen? Well, I could, I could chase that trail right there, pure in heart. I, to be honest with you, each beatitude could be preached on an entire sermon, each one. But this business of pure in heart is very, very powerful because if you don't get this thing and you don't get it through, you're probably not growing much more in your spiritual life. All right, what's the next beatitude? Does anybody know what I... That stuff just literally evaporates. It's like, it's, like, it's like my tools. Does anybody have tools? They just walk off. They grow legs, walk off. Okay. Somebody said if you lose something, it's usually where you lost it at. <laughs> okay. Now, it said, blessed pure heart. Now, I want you to notice something. Next beatitude is blessed are the peacemakers. This is number seven, peacemakers. What's in the world going on here? A peacemaker is one who brings two people together. This is talking about God, you growing in the Lord to the point of where you are effectively bringing people to Christ by example and by witness. He has given us the ministry of reconciliation, making peace with God. What are, we, what are we preaching here at this church? How to have peace with God. This church, all of us should be peacemakers. Now, what does it say about the peacemaker? The, blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called what? 
Did you know what? If you get to this point, did you know it's at this point in your Christian experience that somebody will look and say, that man's a Christian. They'll say, he's a child of God. They, you know what's going to happen right here at number one? They ain't convinced. And they're not convinced. But let me tell you something. What God does when the heart gets pure and when people can see that your motives was not to make money or to get fame or to get ahead or have some angle to it, they say that's not normal, that's supernatural. And there's a child of God. Lost people will recognize a true child of God. And they have power from God to be used in bringing God and lost people together and them, making, them having peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. This is primarily about soul winning, the effect that you're going to have on other lost men's lives for them coming to Christ. That's what it's about. Does anybody know what the most American people will say about church people and Christianity? They watch TV and what do they say about the televangelist? He's in it for the what? They go to church over there because it's a big social club. They go there to get business. You see, what are they saying? Your heart's not pure. You got ill motives for what you're doing in your Christian life. But God says if your heart's pure, he said your heart's pure, he said you're going to see God in a way. And, and by the way, when you see him, you, what, you know what happens when you see God? It's his glory, his light. Did you know that this is honest truth? A person who has been in touch with God, who is going through this, there'll be the glory of God on their countenance. Yes, sir. Have, have you ever seen anybody like that? There's people that just, man, wow. You know, what happened to Moses? He went up the mountain, saw God. He went, had to put a veil on him. He was so bright with light, they couldn't even stand and look at him. Blind him. Well, we've got to get this next one. So we had a peacemaker, for they should be called children of God. They'll say, hey, that, that, guy, that woman, she's a Christian. You know what makes us matter? Let's go back to meekness just a minute. So you, you sold somebody. Ah, this girl down here. She was trying to sell a dog somebody. Uh, they, you shifted a dog and their, their check or their money was bad. Yeah, she's going, mm, mm, yeah. You know, you do a service. Somebody, you fix their lawnmower and they go around the country tell, you know, and you just, ugh. See, here's what I'm going to tell you. To, you've got to be meek because you, how many, how many here knows you cannot expect people to be honest? Have you, got, have you lived that long? How many of those you can't expect people to tell you the truth? How many of those people will lie? How many of those people will deceive? Quit fooling yourself. Quit expecting people to be nice. Expect them to be sinners. And expect Christians <laughs> to be worse. Hey, I'm a preacher. I've been out in business all my life. I've had guys say straight up to me. They're just going to tell you before we start. I don't trust preachers. Dealt with them. Good enough. Shake hands. At least we're on level ground. Get started here. All right. Let's get the next one here. Bless the peacemakers. God's using you to, uh, to win souls to Christ, to influence people. And then comes this eighth blessing. And oh, it's so wonderful. <laughs> Blessed. <laughs> This is verse 10. Blessed are they which are persecuted for being ignorant, doing stupid stuff. <laughs> What's it say? Righteousness. For righteousness sake. You did right. Yes. And they persecuted you for it. Yes. Now, here's what happens. Well, bless God, I tried to, I got saved and I served God. And I, I tell you what, I tried to win people to Christ. And now look what happens to me. I'm out. I'm done. That's what Christianity is about. And the devil say. What pays serve God, doesn't it? Persecution comes in in the way of loss of money, loss of health, loss of friends, backbiting you, stabbing you in the back, betraying you every way in the world. And by the way, guess where all that mostly happens? In the house of your friends. <laughs> okay. And you're going to say, well, I got saved and I thought everything's wonderful. And man, I started, you know, having the right attitude towards sin. And I was trying, I was, has anybody ever experienced any of this? 
growing in the Lord like this? Because this happens whether you recognize it or not. It's happening to every saved person in this building, every saved person listening to me. It's happening in your life whether you understand it or even realize it's going on. Because it is going on. And the eighth beatitude, by the way, seven is number of completion. And I'm going to tell you what happens. I got saved. Had a right attitude about sin. Amen, I hate sin. Amen, I mean I hate sin. I meek, boy, I tell you what, I don't hit them down, I don't knock their teeth down their throat anymore. And, <laughs> and I'll tell you what, I read my Bible and I love to read my, I love that King James Bible, amen. And, and I've even forgave some people that did some stuff to me. And I'll tell you what, I'm a pretty good Christian. I'll just tell you right now, in case you hadn't noticed, I'm a pretty good Christian. And I'll tell you what, I'll I try to make sure what I'm doing, I'm doing it for the right reason, for God's glory. And do you know what? I led some people to the Lord recently, and that's some people told me they seen me, and that's why they got saved. They watched my life. And then all of a sudden, we're... Good thing God found me when he did. <laughs> and we get proud about who God, by his grace, what he did in us. And you know what God knows? that Reggie needs to be taken down. And down I go, again, not to get resaved, but to be broken again because I'm full of pride now. <clears throat> I've been around a while. Bless God, I was here when you came, and I'll be here when you leave. <laughs> my grandma, my grandpa's buried out there. Nobody's, you know. My great-grandpa gave the land this place was built on. So what? So God blesses us by allowing persecution to come. Isn't that a blessing? <laughs> I'm going to take you back to the Old Testament. You know what God told you? He said, my ways are not your ways. And my thoughts are not your thoughts. And you thought you ought to just get on Glory Hallelujah Boulevard. And get in a, a limousine all the way, rest of the way to heaven, and ride a chariot to rest of the way to heaven. And God said, No, you're getting out. You're going to walk and crawl. And you're haughty and you're proud. You think you're somebody now? Worst, one of the worst things you can do to a preacher is say, I just never heard such good preaching in my life. God has helped me so much, do you? Don't tell me that. Seriously, it's not good for me. I'm not spiritual enough to take it. To be honest about it. Because I'll get home, lay down night. They said that's the best message they ever heard. They said I'd really help them. Am I really that good? Well, it's too bad I'm just down here at Little Norwood. The next thing you know, you're just full of pride. Self-glory. And so then God says, Reggie, it's time for you to take another ride on the roller coaster. Yeah. And down you come. He brings persecution into your life, and it could be in many, many different ways. He said, blessed, there in verse number 10, blessed they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, not for being stupid. <laughs> Can I just be honest with you? Most of my problems in life have come because I was just foolish or stupid. Amen. That's the honest truth. It wasn't because I was being righteous. But anyway, blessed they which are persecuted for righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. All right? God says, if you're persecuted for righteousness' sake, that's a clear sign that you're saved. Okay? Now watch this. Here's the double blessing. Verse 11. Blessed are ye when men shall revile you, persecute you, and say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. They may say things, but it better not be the truth. Amen. It better be false. Okay? Persecute you, say all manner of evil against you. False my verse number twelve. Here's how God says to react to it: Rejoice and be exceeding glad. You know what exceeding glad? I looked that up in Hebrew and Greek, and both means jump up and down and clap your hands. Amen. No, I didn't look it up nowhere. It just means to be exceeding glad. Rejoice. That was Hebrew Greek. Amen. <laughs> Great is your reward in heaven. God says, if you will respond. Watch this. Now, here's what happens. We went this whole deal. Boy, I'll tell you what. And then here come persecution. God brought us down. Well, if that's the way it's going to be, I'm done.
And, we, and, I do, and this is what I call it, kicking out. You thought the last place in the world you'd get hurt was a church. You thought the last person in the world to hurt you was your spouse. You thought the last person in the world to hurt you is your brother. You thought the last person to hurt you in the world was your children. The last person in the world to hurt you is your mom and dad. And God used those very people to hurt you and to bring this persecution into your life. Okay? And here's what we do. We kick out. Now, I'm going to say something to you, and I'm careful about saying this. I really believe there's a lot of people sitting out in their homes on Sunday mornings who have genuinely been saved. They're not church anywhere today. It's not because they're not saved. It's because they didn't know how to respond when God tore, took them down and used other people to do it. They forgot that all things, this blessed are you that persecuted, all things, this persecution is going to work together for good to them that love the Lord and are called according to his purpose. And they think it's working bad for them and they're saying, God, I didn't figure on this, and I just can't handle it, and I'm out. And here's what happens to a lot of people. And by the way, you cannot be at home. You can sit in church and be in this position. You can be, you can be right here. You, you, yeah, you come to church just because out of duty, and you, you do love the Lord, but you're, you're, just, you're, not, you're done growing. You're not going to grow because you're not rejoicing in it, and you're not thanking God for it, and you're not, you know, you're not forgetting. So, but anyway, here's what will happen now. If you respond to it right, which is rejoicing and being exceedingly glad for the persecution, the problems that come your way, the sorrows, the pain, the misery that comes, what will God do? He will start you again on another round of the cycle of your Christian growth. You will have a deeper sense of sin. You will see things now as sin that you didn't see back here. You will realize there's areas of your life that you haven't yielded that you're not meek about. You will have a new hunger and thirst, and you'll want to be closer to God than you ever was. You'll have a deeper thirst for the Word of God than you ever had. You've been through some trials. You've been through some suffering. You've been through some pain. You've suffered with Christ. You will have a new appreciation for, 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 for being forgiven. You'll have a, another purification of your heart. God will then use you more. Now watch what's happening here. If you respond to the 8th and the ninth, and by the way, the number 8 is the number of new beginning. When you got saved, it was a new beginning. When God breaks you again and makes you totally dependent, you're not anything, you weren't anything when he's here. Hey, everybody get this. You and I wasn't anything here, and we still ain't nothing here Amen. apart from Jesus Christ. So what happens is, you're expand if you let God give you the grace to respond to this with humility and say, God, I wasn't anything when you saved me. I'm nothing now. Do with me as you see fit. God will take you on around this cycle of growth. You will reach more people and affect more people than you ever have. But guess what's going to happen? You're going to have to be broken again. Get this in your heart and your head. Until God takes you home, he's going to take you through these cycles. And you're never going to quit being broken by God as long as you're breathing air on this earth. It's just going to be there. But here's the beauty of it. He, he's going to expand your outreach. He's going to enlarge your ministry. Now, I'm going to say something very personal here tonight. This church has been here 40 years. We've been through a lot. Been through a lot. I've seen things I never dreamed, never even remotely dreamed would happen that hurt me the deepest part of my soul. But God in grace has kept me from walking off. And God in grace has kept a lot of you from walking off. Now, that's just the truth. And you just said, God... As long as this is where you got me, I'm just going to stay in here. I'm going to try to serve you and forgive people and get on down the road and keep. I see a bunch of you old timers going, and then you're right. And guess what today? We are reaching more people than we ever dreamed about reaching back these days. It's fact. It works that way. It's truth. We're reaching, my guess is, 50 times the people that we were reaching back here today.
Maybe a hundred times. Maybe a thousand times. I don't know. I'm not worried about it. Whatever it is, it is. I can tell you this. This morning there were people from New Zealand and England and all over the world listening. Many, many states. And um, I got a call from a guy this week, South Carolina. They got 25 people coming from their church to camp meeting. And he said, Reggie, you may have 35. Now, I, don't know how, I don't know whether they'd be 50 here or 500. I don't know. But it's, it's up to God. He knows what we can take care of, and that's going to be fun. Amen? Amen. We're going to have a good time. We ain't going to worry about it fret about it. Somebody has a flat tire, we just try to fix it and get on down the road. Amen. Now, I want you to watch this very carefully, and I'll, we'll shut down. Look at your Bible at the end of the Beatitudes. Now, Remember that eight is the number of new beginning, but there's a ninth blessing, and it's the part of the double blessing with the eighth beatitude. Blessed are you when men shall persecute you. And in verse 12, uh, uh, verse number 10, blessed are they which are persecuted. Verse number 11, blessed are they. So God says, when you get to the end of this cycle, if you respond right, there'll be a double blessing in your life. Nine is the number of Holy Spirit. What's that tell us? That we can only respond to persecution and lying and backstabbing and disappointments and everything by the power of the Holy Spirit working in our life. Yeah. Now, what God, now watch, watch this. This is where God says, this is amazing. Look at verse 13. Ye are the salt of the earth. Do you know who salt of the earth? It's the people that let God take them on that continuous cycle of Christian growth. But look what he said. If the salt has lost its savor, what's that mean? You got bitter at God, bailed out, bitter people. If the salt has lost its savor, where it's supposed to be salted, it's supposed to be good for nothing. And this is why America looks at the churches now today and say, what are they worth? What's, what's they good for in our nation? But to be cast out and trodden under foot of men, that's a military term, by the way. That's a, that's a very strong, serious thing right there. Now watch this. Verse 14, if you operate within this cycle of life and cooperate with God in it, you will be light. You'll not only be salt, you will be light. Okay? A city set on a hill cannot be hid, neither do men light a candle, put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick, and it giveth light unto all that are in the house. You know what God is saying? That if you will let me work this, these beatitudes into your life and keep letting me work this through, no matter how old you get, you will without question be salt in this country, salt in this church, salt in your family. You will be light in your family, light to the people around you. And watch this, the big one. Two things will occur if we let God do this in our life. Number one, we're salt and light. And then here's the last one, verse 16. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Amen. Here's what happens. When a child of God that got saved allows these blessings of the Beatitudes to work in his life by the power of the Holy Spirit, he becomes, his good works glorify, it glorifies God. And they, watch, look at that verse. Let your light so shine before men that they may see this is what people want to see. They want to see people that are broken, not cocky and proud, not self-righteous, totally dependent upon Jesus Christ for salvation. They want to see people that are meek and aren't fighting for everything. They want to see that, or that have a right attitude about sin, that are meek, that have a hunger and thirst after God's word, that are forgiving and merciful to other people, that are pure in heart, their motives are right, and that, and that care about the souls of men. And they say, those people are light and they're salt. And God says, you don't even have to try to be salt and light. You will be salt and light. And you will glorify your Father in heaven because they're going to see this in your life and it will glorify me. And you'll just be a reflector to God. Amen. Now, the last thing I will say to you is this. I ask you tonight, and you don't need to raise your hand or even say anything, but where are you in this cycle tonight? Because if you're saved, you're somewhere in it. Some of you have got several circles, probably. You've been through it. And what God is telling us tonight, don't get discouraged. 
Don't get bitter. Don't quit. Let God do the breaking work and the humility that needs to be in us. I'm going to be honest with you tonight about my own personal walk with the Lord. This deal about pure in heart, God has been showing me pride in my life like I've never seen it before. I am talking sometimes three to four times a day. The Holy, I'll have something go through my head. And like the Holy Spirit said, that's pride. That's pride. And I'm seeing things as pride that six years ago I didn't see as pride. Now why in the world would God do that to me? He loves me. He's trying to conform me to the image of his son. And I just ask you to pray for me. And let's pray for each other that we'll allow God to take us through. Sister Mona, how many cycles have you been through? Several, right? I've watched you go through some. I've watched Phil and his wife go through some cycles. I've watched Dean go through cycles. I've watched some of you people over the years. Don, I watched you go through one and a half. <laughs> no, seriously, I've watched. If you're around people and you love them, you worship God with them, and, and you know them, you'll start observing this. They're going through it. One of the things that we can help each other with is recognize, and you know, not that we know everything going on, but we can sense they're going through, especially when they're going through this rebrokenness. And God's using something to break them. We don't just jump on them or look down on them and condemn them and that kind of junk. We say, you know what? Lord, help that person Amen. to go through this persecution, to go through these trials, through these troubles with the grace of God so that you can continue to use them. The devil will tell you, quit loving him. God doesn't care about you. Got to just bail out of this thing. There's nothing to it. I got a man wrote me an email this week. I don't know where in the world he's from. It's way off from here. And he was in the charismatic movement, and he got blown out of that and all this stuff. And, and he said, I just literally wonder, is there anything to the Bible at all? You know, he's just questioning. He don't, you know, and I tried to answer him this week and tried to encourage him about getting. And this is why we need those 52 outlines. And this is why we need equipment, be equipped to help people grow in the Lord and understand what's going on in their life. I don't need the world's psychologist. I need this book. Amen. I need this book. And I want to tell you all something. I want to love you. I want to love you wherever you're at. Amen. Wherever you're at, I want to love you. I want to encourage you in the Lord to go through. Let God take you through. It'll be worth it all when we see Christ. Amen. What if Jesus would have kicked out in the Garden of Gethsemane when he said, Father, let, if it be thy will, let, be willing, let this cup pass from me. Be let God take him through. I close with this. Somebody near you, somebody you may not even know watching you is watching how you're responding to your persecution. Somebody near you is watching how you're responding to the trials and the troubles and the problems that come your way. And they want to be able to say that man's a true Christian. But they only can say it if we let God do this. I feel so convicted tonight because I fail so much in this, but it's nonetheless the truth. Old brother Reuben Fields told me one time one of the greatest truths I ever got a hold of in preaching. He said, Reggie, your life does not confirm nor unaffirm God's word. Amen. You better get that one. He said, your experiences do not confirm nor not affirm God's word. God's word is true irregardless of how well you're doing or how sorry you're doing. God's word is still true. Amen. Let's stand together. I heard an old, old story. I was
somebody loves me, you can go home, amen. I hope you're glad you came to church tonight.